Okay, uh, everybody, good morning. So today uh, we will talk about the joints. Okay. First, uh, we'll see how we classify the joints. Okay. Then we will talk about the most common type of joint in our body which is called the synovial joints. So we will talk about the properties of synovial joints. Then we will talk about different types of movements can occur in the joints. Then we will talk about couple of major synovial joints in our body. So those are the things uh, we'll cover in today's lecture. First, how to define a joint? Joints are the locations where two or more bones unite or meet. Joint is also called articulation because articulate is the meeting, okay? uniting. So that's the definition. Two or more bones unite or articulate or meet. Right? Now, uh, functions of the joints. Joints hold the bones together in the skeleton. So all the bones are held together in the skeleton by the joints. Give mobility. We know that we move the bones at the joints, right? At the joints. So joints help to move the bones that helps to move the body parts. Those are two important functions. Now, the classification of joints. We classify the joints in two ways. One is called the functional classification okay? and another is called the structural classification. Okay. So, we do the functional classification by looking how much movement is present in the joint. How much movement occurs in the joints. Based on that, we do the functional classification. Structural classification is based on the structures hold the bones together in the joints. What kind of structures holding the bones together? Okay. Based on that, we do the structural classification. First, we will see the functional classification. Based on the amount of movement, we divide the bones of our body into three <coughs> groups or types. Synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, and diarthrosis. Synarthrosis are the joints where no movement 
occurs. So, fixed joints, no movement occurs, immovable. Example, you know your cranial bones, right, are attached to each other by sutures. So, sutures are the examples of synarthrosis because we can't move the cranial bones. So, they're fixed. Uh, that one is small movement occurs. So that's the amphiarthrosis. Yeah. Amphiarthrosis are the joints where little movement, small amount of movement occurs. Not a lot. Okay. Slightly movable. Example, your ribs, you know, are attached to the sternum, right? And when you breathe, you know, the ribs move slightly. Not too much, right? Slight movement occurs. So, that's a good example of amphiarthrosis. Slight movement occurs. Diarthrosis. A lot of movement occurs in diarthrosis. Freely movable joints. For example, your shoulder joint. You can move a lot, right? Your hip joint, your ankle joint, elbow joint temporomandibular, those are the diarthrosis. Now, uh, easy way to remember is SAD, SAD, synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, diarthrosis. Okay. No movement, small movement, lot of movement. Most of the diarthrosis are synovial type joints. So, just know that most of the diarthrosis or freely movable joints are synovial type joint. Are sutures in the skull considered joints? Synarthrosis. You said most are diarthrosis though. Yeah, most of the diarthrosis are synovial. Now, structural classification based on the structures <coughs> bind the bones together. We classify the joints into three types fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Okay? So, those three are the structural classifications. From the name of top two, you can tell what kind of structures hold the bones together. In fibrous joints, the fibrous connective tissue hold the bones together, are present in the joints. In cartilaginous, cartilages attach the bones together. Synovial joint is different. In synovial joint, actually, there is a space. So, no structure is attaching the bones together. You have fluid in that space. Okay. So, in synovial joint, there is a space and fluid is present there. So, no, you know, a hard structure is connecting the bones. That's why you can move the synovial joints a lot. That process, a lot of movement can occur because bones are not strongly attached to each other. There is a gap and fluid is present in between. Okay, first we will talk about the fibrous joints. The bones are attached by dense fibrous connective tissue, dense type connective tissue and no joint cavity is present, usually synarthrotic, immovable. Now, fibers could be three different types, sutures, syndesmosis, and gomphosis. So, those are three types of fibers, sutures, syndesmosis, and gomphosis. Sutures, uh, sutures 
are the joints where the cranial and some facial bones articulate. So, sutures are present in the skull. And you know that no movement occurs in the suture type of joints. Uh, if you see the joint under the microscope, suture under the microscope, what you will see, you will see the bones are held together by short interconnecting fibers. So, very short interconnecting fibers hold the bones together like this, the fibers. Uh, and that is why uh, the bones cannot move. So, this is one type of fibers. Another type of fibers is syndesmosis. In syndesmosis, the bones are connected by ligaments. Ligaments are bands of fibers, tissue. This type of fibers joint could be immovable or slightly movable. Sutures are immovable, but syndesmosis could be immovable or slightly movable. Example, distal tibiofibular joint. You know that tibia and fibula are two bones of your leg. Uh, this is the proximal end. This is the distal end. Okay, close to the ankle. So here you have the ligament that connects the bones together, hold the bones together. Okay, so that's the uh, syndesmosis. Slight movement occurs there. Another type of fibrous joints are gomphosis. Gomphosis um, are easy. Uh, the teeth articulate with your jaw bones, mandible and maxilla. You know that uh, in bony sockets. So teeth articulate the bony socket uh, at gomphosis. So here you see, uh, you have seen the sutures before. This is uh, a picture of syndesmosis. This is the lower end of tibia and fibula. So you see a ligament uh, that holds the bone together. And in the right side, that is a gomphosis type of joint, tooth articulates with the bony socket of your jaw bones, maxilla and mandible. Now, uh, uh, one thing uh, remember here is in gomphosis joint, tooth is attached to the socket by a ligament that is called the periodontal ligament periodontal ligament okay, around the tooth. So, you see here uh, that picture uh, is showing that yellow uh, under the yellow structure this this is the periodontal ligament okay, uh, that connects the bone to the socket. This is the socket the socket formed by the bone and this is the tooth and this is the periodontal leg. Okay. Do you have any question? Yeah. Uh, do you give another example of gomphosis? Gomphosis only present uh, um, in the in the jawbone. That's the teeth and the bony socket. Yeah. Those are only gomphosis. It's one and done. Yeah. Uh, only those are the gomphosis. Yeah. Cartilaginous. So, those are three types of fibers. We are done with fibers type of structure. Then cartilaginous. There are two types of cartilaginous joints. One is called synchondrosis, another is called symphysis. The difference is in case of synchondrosis, the bones are connected by hyaline type cartilage. In case of symphysis, bones are connected by fibrocartilage. So, that is the difference. Okay? If the bones are connected by hyaline, that is the synchondrosis and by fibrocartilage, that is symphysis. 
Now, often you will see that we use both SIS and SES. For example, Symphysis. Sometimes we use Symphysis. The difference is uh, this is one if we indicate only one SIS, if we indicate more than one SES. So this is singular, this is plural. Okay. So those are two types of cartilaginous joints. Here you see two examples of synchondrosis. That means hyaline cartilage connect the bones. One is the epiphyseal plate. It is actually considered as a joint, although it is inside the humerus. The head part of humerus is attached to the shaft by a thin plate of hyaline cartilage and this is also considered as a joint that <coughs> is the uh, synchondrosis because that is hyaline cartilage. Uh, you see here the next one, the first rib is attached to the manubrium of the sternum. So, by hyaline cartilage. So, that is another example of synchondrosis. Now, you see here one thing. This is the first rib and manubrium hyaline cartilage. So, this is synchondrosis. These other ribs are also connected to the sternum by hyaline cartilage, but we don't include them in synchondrosis. Why? Because they have some properties of synovial joint. Okay, so that's why we don't include that. Only first one is included <coughs> in synchondrosis, not others here. Symphysis, fibrocartilage connects the bones or attaches the bones. Example, intervertebral discs. You know that intervertebral discs connect the vertebrae, the bodies of vertebrae. So, this is an example of symphysis. Another piece of fibrocartilage connect, uh, connects the two hip bones at pubic symphysis. You already know uh, anteriorly two hip bones are connected by pubic symphysis and that piece of cartilage is a fibrocartilage. Okay, so that is another example of symphysis type of joints. So just remember that uh, if I ask you intervertebral discs or pubic symphysis, what kind of joints? Those are symphysis. Right? So that's because they are connected. Bones are connected by fibrocartilage. Okay. Now the synovial joints. I told you that synovial joints are the most freely movable joints. A lot of movement can occur. There are some exceptions, uh, but in most of the synovial joints, a lot of movement can occur. Um, small amount of movement occur in those synovial joints. Uh, one, as I told you, the, those ribs are connected to the sternum. Another example is intercarpal, in between the carpal bones, a uh, small amount of movement occurs in your wrist. But this joint is the wrist joint, a lot of movement occurs, right? But you have how many carpals here? How many short bones? Eight in two rows, right? And they are connected to each other, right? So, a small amount of movement occurs uh, there. That's the... Uh, <coughs> one type of synovial but small amount of movement occurs. So now if I classify first you help me functional based on how much movement occurs. How many types we have? Three. S A D right? 
synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, diarthrosis. No movement, small movement, lot of movement. Make sense? Okay. Then structural classification. Let's do this way. Uh, so joints. Okay. First we divide into two types. Uh, functional. Two ways we classify. Functional classification and structural classification. Okay. So first we do that way. Then functional. Uh, three types. Synarthrosis and here synarthrosis. Diarthrosis. And here process. Process and that process. Okay. So those three types of functional. Now structural uh, would be fibrous, fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Fibrous could be how many types? How many of you remember? Three. Sutures. Very good. Sutures. Then syndesmosis, right? Sutures, syndesmosis, and gomphosis. Then cartilaginous, how many types? Two. Very good. Synchondrosis and symphysis. The two types of cartilaginous. Synchondro... <coughs> small area here. Synchondrosis, you have written, just uh, follow it. And symphysis. Okay, symphysis. Those are two types of cartilaginous. And... Synovial, uh, there are seven different types of synovial. We won't go into detail. Just know that uh, synovial are the most freely movable and most common type also. Joints are synovial and there are seven different types of synovial joints uh, are present. Okay, So that is how uh, we first classify <coughs> the joints. Okay, If you just write it down, it will be easy to follow. Right? You follow easily. Now, uh, we'll see the properties of a synovial joint. A synovial joint has some important characteristics or properties. What are those? Synovial joints have articular cartilages, joint cavities, articular capsule, and synovial fluid. So, those are the properties of a synovial joint. This is the picture of a synovial joint to show the properties. I mentioned to you before that in synovial joints, the bones are not attached to each other by any structure. There is a gap like this. That's why a lot of movement is possible. So, that gap is called the synovial cavity and fluid is present in the cavity that is called the synovial fluid. So, this is the synovial cavity, these two are bones and inside the synovial cavity you have fluid called the synovial fluid. And then uh, the end of the bones, you see these two bones, the end of the bones are covered by hyaline cartilage also called articular cartilage. So, bones are covered by the articular cartilage which is hyaline type cartilage. And another thing is around 
the joint so this is the joint around the joint you have capsule that covers the joint hold the bones together so that capsule covers and hold the bones together so those are four important properties of a synovial joint okay you need to remember those i may ask you to write the properties or draw a typical synovial joint and identify the structures in it okay in some synovial joints not in all you will find another type of structures those are called bursa why we did not include bursa here because uh, these are the typical properties of a synovial joint but bursa are present in many but not in all synovial joints that's why we did not include bursa as a property of synovial joint in some uh, in many synovial joints you have bursa particularly the lower synovial joints have bursa what so are bursa so why don't we include because uh, it is not a typical characteristic many synovial joints don't have so we cannot say that this is a property of a synovial joint right so, so bursa but, has everything synovial has but has more a bursa is present in some synovial joints but not in all that is number 1 bursa are present in large synovial joints not in small synovial joints okay so we cannot say that uh, bursa are present in synovial joint we can say bursa are present in some synovial joints right that's why okay um that is like this you know this funny example that many people have bought that we cannot say that uh, you know bald is a property of you know the man most of the people have here so that, that's why we don't include bald it's just because it's not present in all synovial joints large synovial joints have bald okay so that's why you need to know and it plays a very important function in the joints so cut our barsa flattened fibrous sacs lined with synovial membrane so in one sentence you can say bursa are fluid filled membranous sacs repeating again <coughs> bursa are fluid filled membranous sacs and <coughs> why you have bursa in many synovial joints because bursa act like ball bearing see here this is a bone and this is a tendon or ligament and your bursa is this one this is the bursa so what happens bursa reduces the friction uh, between the ligament or tendon and the bone when bone moves the bursa rolls make sense in between those two so increases the movement as well as reduces the friction so those two are important functions of bursa reduces the friction and increases what the mobility or movement so bursa are found in between the tendons and bones or in between the ligaments and bones skin and bones okay uh, and reduces the friction and increases the mobility or movement yes is it arthritis or bursitis 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 is the inflammation of bursa right and bursitis uh, have you heard this bursitis is the inflammation of bursa you said bursitis or arthritis arthritis. arthritis arthritis is a different thing it's the inflammation of the soft tissue in the joints okay uh, anyway so you reminded me bursitis that's good <laughs> so uh, in bursitis what happens since the bursa uh, inflammation occurs in bursa the movement gets restricted and painful 
because friction occurs, the balls or bursa will not roll a lot. So the movement will be restricted and painful. Okay. Sometimes bursa can burst. If something, for example, hits, right, then the bursa will burst. The fluid will come out because bursa are filled with fluid, fluid-filled sacs, right? Uh, so, it could be very painful and movement will be severely restricted. Here is an example. You see how Barsa works. This Barsa is <coughs> present in your shoulder joint. In between the coracoacromial ligament and the head of the humerus. So, uh, that green structure, that flattened fluid filled sac is the bursa and when you see what happens when you move your shoulder the bursa is here this is the coracoid and acromion you already know the ligament is here the coracoacromial ligament and your bursa is here so when you move the shoulder uh, the humerus what happens the bursa will go like this okay. so that will increase the movement and reduces the friction make sense so, <clears throat> that is just an example of how it works. Okay, now we will talk about the movement in the joints. Uh, you know that bones move at the joints, right? Bones move at the joints. By the muscles. Without muscles, bones will not be able to move at the joints. So, bones move at the joints with the help of the skeletal muscles. Okay? And the bones move towards the origin of the muscle. That means what? You know that the skeletal muscles have origin and insertion. What is the difference? For example, this is your arm, this is the humerus, and this is your radius in the forearm. Okay? There is a muscle like this. So this is the muscle. So when this muscle contracts, what happens? You see here. This is uh, the muscle. When this muscle contracts, your forearm moves towards the arm. Right? That happens. Your arm is not moving towards forearm. Forearm is moving towards the arm. Right? So, the end is moving. That is the insertion. And this fixed end is origin. So, the end of the muscle attached to the fixed bone, that's the origin. The end of the muscle that is attached to the bone moves, that's the insertion. So, now we can say that insertion moves towards the origin. Okay? And that causes the movement of the bone. Most insertions going to be uh, distal or uh, Usually, usually, but we cannot say that way and don't think that way because, uh, for example, your mandible is moving towards the maxilla, right? So that is not moving towards the uh, proxima, that is going away from the trunk. So it's going upwards, right? So we cannot say that's moving towards the uh, body towards the proximal. So. Right, but contraction causes the <coughs> movement upwards. Okay, uh, so that's the different thing. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so origin and insertion. Insertion moves towards the origin. Now, uh, movement occurs in different planes. What are the planes? Transverse plane, frontal plane, and sagittal plane. 
you have some idea uh, from the lab about this so transverse let's first see transverse what is the transverse plane this one right this is the transverse plane so now um, if i move my head like this this is the transverse plane movement make sense so that is an example of transverse plane movement rotation of the head now frontal you know that frontal or coronal plane is this way right do you remember okay so now if i move my head like this that's the frontal or coronal plane movement i'm moving in this direction right this or this sagittal if i move my head like this this is the sagittal plane you know that right this way so sagittal plane movement those are the main uh, planes we move our joint now sometimes we move in combination of uh, those planes uh, different types of movements in synovial joints many different types of movements can occur in synovial joints gliding angular movements rotation and special movements first i will talk about gliding gliding occurs in between the flat surfaces for example this is one bone you have almost flat surface here or this is a bone flat surface and this is another bone has flat surface so this is the gliding type movement where you see the gliding type movement in your body in carpal bones you know that carpal bones are short bones right so they are attached like this and small amount of gliding movement occurs see here in between the carpal bones like this okay so two flat surfaces angular movements there are different types of angular movements in which the size of the angle changes so simple way size of the angle changes increases or decreases that's why called the angular movement example flexion extension hyper extension now you see hinge hinge joint is in in between the fingers okay. yeah this diff different here yeah. uh, so uh, yeah hinge is one type of synovial joint there are seven different types of synovial joints right i said seven different types of synovial joint uh, so that is hinge is one a uh, ball and socket pivot type of pivotal joints those are seven different types of synovial we we are not going into detail of that okay now <coughs> uh, flexion you see here this is the forearm and this movement is called the flexion of the forearm now you tell me see this angle here in flexion this angle is getting bigger or is smaller smaller so in flexion the angle size gets smaller opposite of flexion is called the extension so see here this is the flexion of the forearm and this is the extension of the forearm right the angle size gets what smaller in flexion how about in extension larger opposite okay so here now you see my head this is see this angle here this is what flexion because angle is smaller right and this is extension right now after i come back to my anatomical position normal position if i ask you do more i can do more right that is hyper extension so beyond the extension anatomical point if you go further that is hyper extension uh, now you see here this is what flexion of the forearm right this is extension can i do hyper extension here no i cannot do so in some joints you can do hyper extension not in all okay here you see uh, this is your thigh see this angle this is flexion right getting small 
this is extension i can do hyper extension too right i can move back so some joints you can do hyper extension not in all joints okay so those are uh, angular also abduction adduction abduction is taking the bone away from the body so for example if i move my arm away this this is called what abduction and bringing towards the body is adduction okay so this is abduction right this is adduction so size you see here also the size of the angle is changing right getting bigger in abduction getting smaller in adduction circumduction if i ask you to draw a circle with your hand or foot that is called circumduction so this is the circumduction make sense have you seen cricket you have seen baseball right definitely yes i don't know if any of you have seen cricket uh, it's very popular in europe right uh, so in baseball uh, you do like this in cricket you can't do that you have to do the circle okay that's the circumduction okay you have to release the ball doing like this you can bend here so the uh, best way if you draw a circle that's the circumduction of my shoulder this is the circumduction of my hip joint <coughs> rotation rotation is the movement in which the axis will not change now you see if this is the axis this is you know that second cervical vertebrae you remember dense okay and this is the atlas first cervical vertebrae right and we move atlas like this this one is not changing right so rotation is the movement in which the axis will not change so this is rotation the axis will not change still like this make sense so this is lateral rotation this is medial rotation this is lateral rotation medial rotation okay um rotation is the only movement in which the axis will not change what is this rotation right because the axis is not changing what is this axis is changing you see so this is circumduction make sense if you draw a circle that circumduction axis is changing in rotation it is not changing right staying same okay <clears throat> special movements supination pronation supination is facing up so this is the uh, position called supine your palm is facing up and when you move from supine to prone position that is called pronation so where you are ending this is pronation okay now you are ending where in supine position right so this is supination that's the best way to say ending this is pronation ending this is in this is called supination okay uh, now sometime you also do supination and pronation in your body you lie on the bed right so sometimes we, we do like this so that's the pronation and when we come back uh, the anterior surface is facing up that's the supination uh dorsiflexion plantar flexion it uh, those movements occur in the foot you know that in the foot this is the dorsal surface this is the plantar sole is the plantar surface okay so when i move towards the dorsal surface that that is dorsiflexion makes sense when i move towards the plantar that means sole that's the plantar flexion dorsiflexion plantar flexion what the foot also what is the you move to the inside inversion yeah oh, we were talking about that it is inversion next is inversion and eversion what is inversion if this is your foot you see uh, this is big toe right if this is your foot this is the big toe so if you move the big toe up that will move the sole of the foot towards you make sense that is called inversion now if you move the yeah, uh, big toe down that is eversion now you can try this is what i am moving my big toe up right so this is inversion down eversion 
so inversion inversion uh, protraction uh, sorry protraction and retraction sometimes you will see uh, protruded mandible have you seen that uh, sometimes you will see people have protruded mandible that means the mandible is pushed outwards forward right so that is called protraction if i move my mandible forward that is protraction and if i bring back that is the retraction and we use these terms in in you know our daily life like we have retracted the soldiers from iraq you will see in the newspaper that kind of things right retraction pulling back so pushing out is protraction pulling back is retraction inversion uh, sorry uh, elevation and depression elevation is moving up depression is moving down okay elevation depression now uh, also in your mandible if i open the mouth that is what depression right of mandible when i close the mouth elevation depression elevation okay so those are uh, different types of movement occur in different types of synovial joints here you see gliding in the wrist joint flexion extension hyper extension of the head uh, also flexion extension hyper extension of the body flexion extension hyper extension uh, only flexion and extension no hyper extension possible uh, there abduction adduction circumduction rotation of the head lateral rotation medial rotation okay uh, here one thing when you do the pronation of your forearm you see this is the pronation right this is supination when you do the pronation what happens your radius and ulna they cross so this is the radius lateral bone crosses over the ulna when i move here you see if i do like this this end of radius will move to the other side so what happens the bone crosses like this okay in pronation when i do supination again come back side to side the distal end will move to the opposite side this is the distal end right will move to the other side the medial end also not not really it will not cross it will stay in the same side right yeah some rotation occurs there okay so those are different types of movements now we'll just talk about couple of large synovial joints the large synovial joints in your skeleton are knee joint elbow joint shoulder joint hip joint those are the large synovial joints we'll see uh, one or two of those joints to see what kind of structures are present inside the synovial joint first we'll talk about the knee joint knee joint is the largest and most complex joint uh, so this is the knee joint why it is called a complex joint because knee joint is formed by three different joints so three different joints together bundled together to form the knee joint what are those three different joints inside the knee joint one is femoropatellar joint between the femur and patella knee cap and then lateral and medial tibio femoral joint you know that tibia and femur they join at the knee joint now you know in the lower end of femur you have two condyles 
see here, this is the media, two conducts, electrical and media. Also, upper end of tibia has two conducts. So, these two conducts form two different joints here. And this is femoropatellar joint. It is femur and patellar. So, lateral and medial tibiofemoral and femoropatellar joints, those are three joints together form the knee joint. That's why it is called a complex, uh, the most complex joint. <coughs> now, if you see uh, inside the knee joint, you see, you know, you know, this is a typical synovial joint. So, what you supposed to see inside? You supposed to see that the bones are covered by articular cartilage, right? That is a property of synovial joint. We have seen that before. So, you see uh, the blue structures cover the end of the bones. Those are articular cartilages, hyaline type of cartilage. You are supposed to see a cavity or a space in between the bones. That is the synovial cavity. You see there. Articular cartilage, synovial cavity. Uh, you have fluid here, synovial fluid, okay? Also, uh, inside the knee joint, you will see cruciate ligaments. Probably many of you have heard cruciate ligament, right? Cruciate ligaments uh, connect the bones. There are two, anterior and posterior cruciate ligaments. Then, uh, around the joint, you have bursa. Different, uh, few different bursas are present here. You see those green structures. Above the patella, you have supra patellar bursa. Makes sense, the name, right? Supra patellar bursa. Because it is above the patella. Below the patella, you have infrapatellar bursa. Okay, that's the deep infrapatellar bursa. That also makes sense. Now, you see, under the skin, before the patella, that means between the skin and the patella, anterior surface of the patella, you have subcutaneous prepatellar bursa. That, that name also makes sense, right? Subcutaneous means under the skin, right? Prepatellar. Before you hit the patella, you will get that bursa. Pre means before. So, subcutaneous prepatellar bursa. Uh, so, those are few bursa around the knee joint uh, to reduce the friction and increase the mobility. <clears throat> okay, uh, now if you see outside of the joint, you see that uh, above the patella you have tendon of quadriceps femoris. These muscles of the front of the thigh, these are called quadriceps muscles and these muscles form a tendon here. The tendon gets attached to the upper end of the patella. So that's why it is called tendon of quadriceps muscles. And then the patellar ligament which is below the patella that connects the patella to the tibial tuberosity. Okay. So, above the patella, you have the tendon of quadriceps femoris muscles and that tendon connects the quadriceps muscles to the patella. So, remember, when you see the structure connects the muscle to bone, that is called a tendon. Muscle to bone. When the same structure connects a bone to another bone. That is called a ligament. The so same structure, structurally they are same, but when muscle to bone, that is the tendon, bone to bone, that is the ligament. 
So that's why you see the one above the patella that's a tendon and below the patella that is a ligament. Patellar ligament has a clinical significance. You know that we do the knee jerk testing, right? Uh, sometimes if you go to the doctor, we'll take a small hammer and hit on your patellar ligament to see if your leg kicks forward. That's the knee jerk or knee reflex testing. In both sides of the knee joint, you have collateral ligaments. In tibial side, you have tibial collateral. In fibular side, you have fibular collateral ligaments. Now, in between the <coughs> patellar ligament and collateral ligaments, you have uh, the patellar retina cooler. Okay, medial and lateral patellar retina coulomb. Retina coulomb is also uh, same structure of ligament or tendon but if you see it is like a flat sheet thin flat sheet that is called retina coulomb okay tendons or ligaments are more kind of thick and round but retina coulomb is more flat like a thick uh, flat paper okay uh, this is the upper surface of the tibia inside the knee joint. You know that the bones are covered by articular hyaline type cartilage, but in the knee joint, around the articular cartilage, you have fibrocartilaginous structure. So we know that articular cartilage is hyaline type cartilage, right? Remember that hyaline. But in knee joint, you have another cartilaginous structure around that that is called the meniscus. So you have lateral and medial meniscuses and these are fibrocartilage, not hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage. And you know that sometimes uh, uh, tearing or how to say that, the meniscus breaks, right? Uh, that happens uh, often. So you have to change the meniscus or repair the meniscus. Uh, turning, it's a turning of meniscus right? that, that occurs. Okay. Here you see uh, the, the turning of the meniscus and also turning of the cruciate ligament and lateral collateral ligament. So if something hits from one side, usually we see turning of the ligaments or meniscus in the other side uh, because the pressure occurs more in the opposite side. Like if something hits this way, uh, pressure will be more in this side, right? Because when it bends, uh, the pressure will be in the uh, opposite side, the pressure will be more, but it depends what kind of accident is that. Uh, shoulder joint, another synovial joint, large synovial joint is the shoulder joint. Shoulder joint is also called glenohumeral joint because you already know that glenoid cavity of the scapula and head of the humerus, right, from the shoulder joint. So that's the glenohumeral joint. Glenoid cavity, remember the shallow cavity in the scapula, I told you the head of the humerus can easily come off, right? So that's the glenohumeral joint, shoulder joint. It is a ball and socket type synovial joint. Why? Because head of the humerus is like a ball, spherical, and this is a socket, glenoid cavity. Another large ball and socket joint is your hip joint, head of the femur and acetabulum. Okay. Uh, around the shoulder joint, you have few ligaments. They enforce the joint. Uh, what are those ligaments? Coracohumeral ligament, coracacromial ligament, and three glenohumeral ligament. Those names are very easy. If you know those bone parts, it, it is really easy. Coracohumeral. 
you know the coracoid process of the scapula, right? This is the coracoid process of the scapula, and this is the humerus, so coracohumerus, make sense? Coracoid process to the humerus, upper end of the humerus. Coracoacromial, between the coracoid process and acromion. So coracoid process, acromion, Three glenohumeral between the glenoid around the glenoid cavity and the humerus. You know this is the glenoid cavity, so from uh, the side of the glenoid cavity to the upper end of the humerus. So from the side of the glenoid cavity to the upper end of the humerus, glenohumeral. So those are uh, the ligaments around the shoulder joint. Now uh, I have already mentioned that under the gleno, uh, under the coracoacromial ligament, you have a bursa that is called subacromial bursa, subacromial bursa. Uh, and that separates the ligament and the head of the humerus. And when you move your humerus uh, like this, the bursa rolls, right? To reduce the friction. Um, you see those ligaments uh, they have shown here. So those are the uh, two large synovial joints. Uh, so you got an idea how the synovial joints are formed and structures inside the synovial joint. Okay.